My name is Hoyt Yateman. I'm Senior Visual Effects Supervisor at DreamQuest Images. On the rock, uh, there was an underwater sequence that Michael Bay wanted to have, which is where the seals first um, have to approach Alcatraz. And so they're released from a, a large uh, helicopter and travel underwater toward the island. We knew that most of the sequence was going to be done wet for wet, in other words, physically in the water with divers and cameras. The divers are using what they call rebreathers, which is a military-style version of an aqua lung. It basically takes the exhaled air and reprocesses it so that there are no bubbles. So um, even though there are bubbles here, this is in the testing phase when we're kind of rehearsing. And you can see Pete Romano again using his underwater hydroflex housings and aeroflex equipment to shoot the actual underwater wet for wet um, scenes. But there was a, a number of shots that uh, Michael wanted that would open up the scene, make it look much larger. So there's always a debate, I think, in one's mind, particularly today, when you could use either CG or computer graphics and or models. So what we have here is a sculpture that's being done. It's a quarter scale. It's sculpted in plasticine by an artist. In other words, it's one quarter the size of a normal-sized human. The sculpture will eventually go through a casting process that will be made out of uh, s uh, silicone. They'll make molds out of silicone, and in that they'll inject the foam. Again, because these models are ha hung from wires, they have to be very light. So it's critical that the materials we use are lightweight in nature, but produce very, very accurate uh, surface detail. So the silicone molds produce really good, accurate representation of the models that we sculpt, and the fiberglass and epoxy resin is a very durable, strong, lightweight material to actually build the models out. Of. Here you can see the armature. Each puppet was basically a marionette that was driven and, and actually played by a motion control device, a stepper-driven device. So much like a marionette, it needs a skeleton or a bone structure. So we build out of aluminum a relative humanoid frame that actually has lead pieces mounted in it to give it weight. So when it's hung from the wires, it will hang in, in the kind of prone position. And many people ask us, you know, why put all that detail in when you don't see it? But I think it's really important because you feel it. If it weren't there, you'd see an absence of it, and you'd wonder why isn't this doesn't look right, you know. So the more energy and effort that goes into the model, the better off it usually is. It also frees the, the, the uh, stage crew and the film uh, DP to actually go in tighter than he might want to. You know, it gives him the flexibility that he has on the stage. He's not limited by the quality of the models. Therefore, he can do most anything that he wants. Here we have kind of the R&D section. This is you know, keep basically finding out how to move the puppet in a realistic way and figuring out how many wires or the minimum number of wires we could apply to each puppet. So what we did is we brought in a true marionette artist, a puppeteer, and said, here, if you had anything you want, how would you make this puppet kick and look like he's moving through the water? So by having him go through and videotaping the procedures that he used, we were then later to go in and analyze what actual axes had to be created. So here what we have is a stepper-driven marionette rig that has yaw, pitch, and roll. And it's based upon, believe it or not, a helicopter swash plate, which is the cyclic part of the helicopter. And it allows us to have rotational movements as well as uh, tilt movements. And so by playing with this, we're able to give the illusion that he's kicking. It's also a careful combination of weighting. Each, each model had to be cut open at the thigh and leg area, and small little leads used in fishing uh, was used to give enough weight to the model so that as the uh, uh, wire was released, the leg would go down. So this is a very important part of the process, is really working out the technology so by the time you do get to stage, you're not spending a lot of time dealing with the mechanics, you're more concerned about the aesthetics. Here we have the environment. Again, it's mostly a blue void, but we have to create the kind of drainage, broken drainage section that the uh, divers swim up to. So again, it's using very simple materials, PVC pipe, cardboard tubes, and we sculpt little sea urchins and creatures and crustaceans and cast them up. And here you can see they're making plants and things to give the a feel of, a, of a, an aquatic background. Detailing, aging, and paint plays a very, very large part in the finished product and what it looks like on screen. Um, Okay, here we have the motion control stage. This is where the models are now brought onto the stage. It, we're not completely finished with each of the final detail, but it's well enough along that we want to put something on film. Dry for wet photography is essentially the use of smoke, lighting effects, and filters to give the illusion of underwater. Here, we're not that deep. We're only about 30 or 40 feet below the surface. So to give the surface light, we have, you can see some rays coming from the upper left screen. We can see like a cucoloris. Basically, it's a, it's a wooden structure that's been cut out in odd shapes. And that is moved again by a stepper mover driven by the computer. And that gives the illusion of shafts of light as if it's penetrating a surface. 
The motion control rig runs from a ceiling rig called the gantry. It's a very large device. It's 96 feet in length and about 70 feet in width, and it has three bridge cranes that move across. So each of these divers are mounted onto a separate, separate bridge, and each bridge carries a marionette movement. Uh, I think in total we had somewhere around 56 axes of motion control all working together. Each diver had a separate program, so they were kicking independent from one another. Um, using different filters, both on the lights and on the lens, is very important because, again, you have to give the illusion of aerial perspective, or I should say aquatic perspective. The attenuation of the light as it goes further away. Uh, we'll, we'll put bluer gels on the miniature lights that are the ones furthest and less blue gels on the ones that are closer because, again, light naturally transitions to blue as it travels through a column of water. The motion control camera is a very useful tool because it allows us to crank at a very slow frame rate. We're probably somewhere between 8 and 16 seconds per frame. This offers us two things. One is control, because we are running on cables. The second is that we can get the depth of field required to give the illusion that these quarter-scale miniatures are indeed full scale. Having the motion control also allows us to do the choreography. We're able to have all the divers move together, the camera move, all the lighting gags that we have in the ceiling to give the illusion of, of the shafts of light under very controlled conditions. You also notice that the shafts that hold up the models have to be eliminated too. So this, uh, by the ability of repeating, allows us to go in and actually remove the rods. What we do is we put um, an orange kind of um, reflective material on the rod, and then using ultraviolet light, we can then do a separate element called a mat pass and that will actually photograph these shafts or sticks. Then in a digital we use the paint system to go in and actually remove the rot rod with an empty plate and therefore the audience doesn't see what's actually suspending each of the puppets and the illusion is pretty convincing that they're actually floating in this kind of aquatic environment. Here's a time-lapse view of the drive for wet photography done on the motion control stage. This took about maybe an hour and a half to shoot. It's time compressed and you can see all the different rigs in the ceiling moving. So you also notice in the right hand corner the light effects I was talking about earlier. That's being driven by the motor uh, motors as well so it gives the shafts of light that we see in the actual uh, water effect. Something else we add later are those uh, bubbles. That's a very important part of what goes on as well. So what we produce are kind of these phantom ships that ride within the actual silhouette of the ship, and they're producing these cavitational bubbles, which are actually particle elements. They're elements that are generated in computer and then composited very carefully, and they have the kind of float and feel of bubbles. One ship will push the bubbles from another ship, and that actually helps give the illusion that the ships are underwater.